Welcome back. As we mentioned, Labor Day marks the start of the home stretch of the presidential campaign. And it comes as new polling shows a potentially winding, widening gender gap. A new ABC News Ipsos poll taken after the Democratic convention has Vice President Harris up 13 points among women. Meanwhile, Trump leads by five points among men. That's an 18-point gender gap. Joining me now on set is my NBC News colleague, Ali Vitale. Also with me is Savante Myrick, former Democratic mayor of Ithaca, New York, and president of the, and CEO of People for the American Way, and also Mark Short, former chief of staff to Vice President Mike Pence and an NBC News contributor. So I want to first start with you, Ali, because you, of course, wrote a book on women being elected. So what do you make of this 18-point gender gap? It's huge. And typically, the thing that struck me is that gender gaps are typically driven over the years by men becoming more conservative. White women reliably, and people were surprised at this for some reason in 2016 and 2020, when they saw the ways that President Trump was able to earn the majority of white women. Some people were like, wait, what? Hillary's on the ballot? No, that's not the way that this works. But what strikes me in this new polling is that we're watching the gender gap change because white women might be shifting the way that they are thinking about voting. It's really early, but when we think about the role that women in the suburbs specifically could play again. We watched them build part of the key coalition for President Biden in 2020. And now President Trump has to either figure out how to talk to these people, which I really don't think he's going to be able to do, given the way that their issue set is around democracy, small d, yeah. and then, of course, abortion and reproductive access, or he risks losing them. And the Harris team is aware that they need them, and they are more than happy to welcome them with open arms. I wonder if I could stick with you for a minute to just talk about the way that Vice President Harris is talking about this. She's a history-making candidate. And I keep thinking about the fact that her mom told her, and she talked about this at her, at her speech, show them who you are, don't let them tell you who you are. She's showing people I'm a history-making candidate, talking yeah. about her family, but she's not talking about it directly in the way that, uh, say, a Hillary Clinton did. We show up how we show up. Right? It's true in every single job that you could have. Everyone knows that Vice President Kamala Harris is historic. I think the way that they're not talking about it is really important because it almost speaks to a thing that might not be a motivator for either reluctant Republicans who might not be too enthused with Trump but still want to see that there's an alternative. Mark knows this so well. Identity politics on the right, it's a bad word. You don't talk about it. And so if you're trying to appeal to those kinds of voters, simply not saying the thing might be enough to just say, hey, listen, I'm not here to talk about that I'm qualified, that, I, that I'm, I'm here as a woman, I'm here as a person of color. No, I'm qualified. I want to do this job. Here's what I want to do with it. And that's the focus, clearly. Yeah. And, and Mark, um, according to the pollster, white women have actually moved closer to Harris since the convention, while white men are moving closer to Donald Trump in that at that same time. How far do you think former President Trump can go by only winning that demographic? Oh, I, I don't think you can. I think you have to win over the, the female vote. And I think that, you know, in 2016, Hillary Clinton was a history-making candidate as well, but she clearly had a personality that wasn't as appealing to many female voters. I think that the challenge for the Trump campaign is that I think there's an opportunity to win over those voters if you're talking about economic issues, if you're talking about Kamala Harris's economic plan, if you're talking about safety in your communities. But unfortunately, I think this campaign has been run so much on personality attacks that that's probably less appealing to suburban women voters. Yeah, and I want to ask you, I mean, when you think about the idea that there, this is still a close race, but <laughs> the Harris campaign with the money and with the organization, they're still calling themselves the underdog mm -hmm. campaign. Do you think they really believe that? Or do you think that this is sort of messaging to get their base, Democrats who might be feeling really good, still mm -hmm. motivated and not feeling like they got this? I actually do believe that the Harris campaign is an underdog. Mm. Men are 47 and 0 in presidential elections. And it's not because we deserve it, just to be honest. Amen. Right? A, <laughs> <laughs> there is a strain of misogyny in our country that is, that is real. Besides that, of course, she's running against a world famous billionaire who has been president before, mm. who survived an assassination attempt and has an enormous money making machine behind him. Right? We all know Donald Trump, but if you strip away that name, if you just say that, a world famous billionaire is your opponent who's been president before, yeah, you just might be the underdog. And you add on top of that, of course, the, the, the rank unfairness of the Electoral College, the fact that people's votes don't count the same, right? In America, everybody's vote should have the same weight. It doesn't. And the Electoral College means that if Democrats are going to win, they probably have to win the popular vote by 3 to 4%, mm. right? So unless she's up by 6% in the polls, she might be behind or tied. 
it is smart to recognize that Democrats still in this election, despite all the energy, the charisma, and the professionalism of the person at the top of the ticket, Vice President Kamala Harris, we are still the underdogs. Yeah. Uh, well, when you put it that way, it makes sense if you if you think about it, if you take the name out and say he was the president and is a billionaire. That being said, Ali, I want to play for you some of Kristen, of course, the moderator of Meet the Press, Kristen's um, exchange with Senator Tom Cotton on the issue of federally funding IVF. Let's take a lesson. Just very quickly, do you know where this money would come from to cover IVF? Because in 2022, some eight billion dollars were paid by... Well, no, again, that's why I say we'd have, to, we'd have to evaluate any specific legislation. So you wouldn't support taxpayer any specific dollars. Le- I'd have to evaluate any specific legislation as I would on any legislation. So you're still undecided on where you stand on this government-funded IVF plan? Well, I, I certainly support couples having access to IVF, and it's not even a controversial issue in any of the 50 states. Uh, it was definitely a controversial issue in Alabama, but setting that aside, I wonder, are Republicans where most Republicans, Ali, where Tom Cotton is when it comes to liking IVF but not knowing whether or not they want to federally fund it? First of all, you can always just say Kristen. She's like the Madonna or Sharon right, of <laughs> politics, especially at this table. But we were actually having this conversation outside, the idea of where Republicans are on IVF and how this issue has changed over the decades. And what I was pointing to outside is this idea that in Alabama, when they revived this idea of an embryo, which is so central to the IVF conversation because it's literally how you are storing these fetuses, it's a question of conception. It's a question of where the Republican Party is on that. It's still a live issue, frankly, when you talk to a lot of these other Republican lawmakers. So yes, I do believe that Republicans by and large support IVF as a way to expand your family, but like the, the technical mechanism of it, I still think is unsettled within the party. Mark, what do you make of this idea of federally funding IVF? I think it's one more example of how lost our party is today on financial issues. We have a top candidate who said he's not gonna touch entitlement spending. We have $35 trillion in debt. Our presidential nominee says he's gonna put a cap on drug prices. Now we're going to pay for IVF funding. I mean, you can't out Democrat Democrats. I mean, they're the ones that want to use taxpayer dollars to fund everything. And somehow, if we're trying to compete with that, yeah. that's a losing strategy. We're not offering an alternative, you mean? What about the, the, you know, there was all this back and forth about sort of where Trump stands on abortion, especially the measure in Florida. Are you feeling a degree of whiplash here? Oh, I, I, I think there's been enormous whiplash. I mean, I think that is he's separated from the people in the administration who actually were pro-life. He's become, he's reverted back to his traditional pro-abortion positions. And I think there's been a consistent step back, um, whether or not that's, you know, basically saying I'm, I'm for chemical abortions or not that's saying um, it's up to the states. If you're basically saying you're okay with abortions in California, New York, and you're okay with chemical abortions, the number of lives you're actually trying to protect is actually a very small percentage. Yeah. And so the president has walked away from those pro-life positions. How, how do you see this issue? Well, I um, truly believe probably for the first time in, in my adult life uh, that it's very easy to be a Democrat right now, <laughs> that we are actually the more organized professional political party. Um, Republicans were famous for being in array while we were in disarray. But now it turns out that there is something wonderfully useful about a coalition that comes up with a platform together and holds that platform together through rules, through legislation, and through process. So that when the emperor has no clothes, right, when President Biden is clearly a a bit too aged to serve another four years, the party can do something about it. Mm. President Trump has transformed the Republican Party into a cult of personality, including the Republican platform, which just said that they passed it there and see, just said, whatever Trump says, we like. So now activists have worked their whole life to pass uh, a a federal prohibition on abortion are now being forced to support a candidate that doesn't want that. Yeah, well, thank you so much. We could talk about this for a while, but thank you so much to all of you. And